How's it going everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this explained video, we're looking at Possessor, following an agent who works for a secretive organization that uses brain implant technology to inhabit other people's bodies, ultimately driving them to commit assassinations for high paying clients. Possessor is a compelling blend of horror and science fiction that really carves out its own bizarre and intriguing niche of the genre, and is amongst, if not my favorite genre film of the year. This hails from Brandon Cronenberg, son of the legendary body horror Canadian director David, behind such memorable classics as Scanners, Videodrome, and The Fly. It seems that his son has picked up on much of the same spirit as his father, because Possessor really feels like a natural evolution of David's style, but presented in a wholly distinct modern perspective. It's very weird and kind of arty in its aesthetic sci-fi body swap story that is hard to digest, but is really the kind of movie that requires at least two viewings to catch everything going on. So it's complex in a story sense and how it's presented, but also has very exciting moments of extreme violence and action that really leave a mark on the viewer. This brings me to the fact that the movie has two different cuts that I couldn't find a lot of info on beforehand. An R-rated one that I saw on streaming and seems to be the only available option in that way, versus what's billed as Possessor Uncut and is available on physical media exclusively at the moment. I really did wonder what the difference was between the two. Was it a bunch of crucial scenes that would totally change everything? It's honestly not too much as far as the runtime is concerned, but does feature more gore that further punctuates the violent moments to an even further degree. Scooping out eyeballs with a fire poker in great detail, anyone? Although it's also worth pointing out that there are no dongs in the R-rated cut compared to the uncut, which has several dong drops. Why is Hollywood so afraid of dongs? Dongs? What's the deal with that? Anyway, while not a huge difference, it still is worth seeking out the uncut version because it does help accentuate the movie's main ideas. And there is a lot to look at with this one because there is almost always more meaning to every scene presented. And each of these important points helps us understand the ending and reasoning behind Voss's big choice. So let's dive into the conscious swapping world of Possessor, breaking down the story, in particular our front and center assassin Voss, and explaining the shocking and heartbreaking twist ending. A woman is in what looks like a hotel bathroom and feels for a particular spot on the middle of her scalp and inserts a needle attached to a cable, gooey insertion and all. She turns on a small device that beeps and cranks a dial. She looks in the mirror staring hard at a reflection, chuckling, and then gets serious and starts to tear up, increasing the intensity on the dial and starts full on sobbing. Entering a lobby, she focuses on a fountain, the water appearing to be flowing backwards, which is pretty odd. She joins several other ladies in matching tracksuits and come to a party on another floor, hearing the distant hum of conversation. She surveys a selection of steak knives and approaches a middle-aged guy jamming the knife in his throat. She goes mental on him, stabbing him viciously over and over again. Her bloodlust satiated, she drops a knife, clattering to the ground. She puts her hand in the blood and feels it with her fingers, in a kind of fascination it appears. She calls for someone to pull me out, her voice sounding distorted. She puts a gun in her mouth, but struggles to pull the trigger, hearing police sirens approaching. Tensing up and getting upset, she can't pull it. Her hand shaking, a group of cops show up, and she pulls the gun on them, getting immediately blasted. She falls to the ground and one more bullet to the cheek finishes her off. Suddenly in a retro futuristic facility, a woman Voss comes to removing an elaborate machine from over her face. Understanding that she was inhabiting the other woman Holly's body in order to assassinate the man via this machine. Her supervisor Gerder is there offering a bucket for her to blow chunks into. Another medic informs them the brain death of Holly is confirmed, so the link between the two has been severed successfully. There are more tests to stabilize her her mentally as well, making sure she is back to being Voss entirely, going through several personal objects and is asked to identify them, like a pipe that belonged to her grandfather and a mounted butterfly that she killed and mounted as a child, but admits that she felt guilty about it and continues to to this day. When given another item, she doesn't recognize it, certain that it's not hers, and it was part of the test, Gerder concluding the results are normal across the board. No evidence of charring or false psyche from her time as Holly. Well, that sounds potentially troubling, Voss is taken aback and is asked if there's anything to flag, like anomalies in the interface, Voss mumbling she's fine when pressed. Well good, because her next contract is almost finalized and it's a big one, goading that she can't have her star performer falling apart on her. But Voss wants to take some personal time and has been talking to her estranged husband Michael. Michael? She repeats in a questioning tone, reminding her that they are separated. She prods further, as Voss felt it's not safe for them anymore, feeling that she was becoming a danger 
to her family. Boss doesn't remember saying that and steps out into the big lobby of a massive commercial building. Got some pretty deep pockets here, boys. Who knows what else they're getting up to here. It seems that Gerder wasn't totally off base in her opinion on Voss's family, as she awkwardly stands outside their home and practices very simple conversation, taking many attempts at a simple, hi darling, trying her best to make it sound genuine, illustrating how at odds the two sides of her have become. The assassin side has changed her as a person to her core, and now becoming a regular person comes with some difficulty. She rings the doorbell, getting a big hug from her son, and her husband offers some food, going right into her practice line about being starving. She naturally hasn't told her family what she really does for work, telling Mike that her trip was fine and extraordinarily dull. They see on the news about the murder, with Holly taking the blame. Liam shows off a weird robot toy that he uses a computer to make dance. Some sweet moves there, Robo Buddy. Also noticing that it bears the same logo as Voss's company, looking like, as we suspected, they do all kinds of stuff there. Not just assassinations, but toys for children. Why not? Cover all your bases. Some friends come over for dinner, and Voss looks distant and uninterested, staring into space and cutting an apple with her knife, not really listening to their jovial discussions. Same goes for later, when she wants them to leave, and Michael obliges, leading to some lifeless sex. Her again, lying there, staring blankly at the ceiling, thinking of that first juicy stab into the lawyer's necks, and starts biting into Michael's. We're really getting the picture of just how dull she feels when she isn't doing her job. The real world just ain't cutting it anymore after all that sweet, sweet violence and murder. And it's almost looking like she's more comfortable in someone else's skin than her own. And she comes to realize this herself, already calling Gerder and apologizes, saying that she's ready to come back to work now. Mike comes downstairs, her explaining that she might have to fly out again. He's confused, thinking that they gave her a break, but well, something's come up, she says. He asks her to move back in, saying he hates this distance that's grown between them. Boss isn't listening, seeing blood streaming from his neck, still unable to disconnect the killer from who she is outside of this. She goes to check in on her sleeping boy and gives him a sniff and awkwardly backs away. Not weird at all, okay. Gerder expresses concern that she's losing Voss, and we come to learn just how important she is to the future of the company. Gerder laments that she's too old for the machine, making it increasingly important to find a replacement, thinking it would be Voss, and she says she'd be honored. Don't forget, that's Gerder's real in-game in their relationship here. Though there is a worrying side to Voss, she brings up how she has a special nature that they've worked hard to unlock, though there's still a problematic thread to a life she thought Voss had moved on from, her family. She has more questions, showing off a shot from the Holly job, her wondering why she would stab him when they provided her with a pistol. Voss argues that it was more in character, but whose character, she asks? She doesn't answer, but we understand that this killer side of Voss is truly something else from her, a character as she describes. Not really Voss, you know? Gerda reveals their next mark, a young man and drug dealer, Colin Tate, who fell in love and got engaged to one of his rich clients who happens to be the daughter of the CEO of Zuthru, a large data mining firm, and they were hired by the CEO's frustrated stepson. The created narrative they're going for is for Colin to be without power in the relationship, feeling emasculated due to Ava being in charge. He inevitably breaks, killing John, Ava, and then himself. It's easy peasy, right? With Ava out of the picture, the stepson Reed becomes CEO, teasing her that the pay is huge and includes money and shares, but the real target is the company itself, as once they own Reed, they also control Zuthru. Damn, some serious corporate espionage shit going on here. Voss initially spies on Colin and Ava in their apartment and listens in to their conversation in an attempt to get a decent mimicry of his cadence and speech patterns, just as she was doing with herself at home. This is another character for her to inhabit. Suddenly, her hand starts to cramp up painfully, and after some effort manages to collect herself, seeing what must be physical symptoms caused by her using the machine. Soon after, Colin is captured on his way to the airport, a nurse seen in the van typing a text on his phone that he's been delayed. Gerder watching the whole thing from afar. Voss says that she's ready and feels great, Gerder offering some final reminders. After initial bonding, she's locked in, and the assassination is scheduled for John's upcoming big party, and they only have three days with no room for error. Warning any longer than that can cause brain damage, and the implant itself will dissolve after five. This sounds pretty hardcore stuff. Are you sure you want to put your brain through this? And make sure to use your calibrator daily, the device that we saw Holly use back in the bathroom that seems to hone in their mental connection to the host. Voss gives the medic some shit, barking to watch his levels. My levels are fine, he argues, but she says she just wants to make sure she's in deep enough, firing back, oh, well, how about you pull the trigger yourself this time? Time, and informs her it might be a rough jump. Just do it, she spits back. We then see this possession process in an abstract sense for ourselves. Boss is in a 
a black void. Her skin melts away, seeing a bunch of flashing images of Colin, and then venture through a fleshy cavern, being reborn in a sense. His skin starts to reform into Colin, and he opens his eyes, now with Voss inside his body. Asleep with Ava, he comes to. He takes a few tentative steps into the other room and feels around his body and checks out his junk. Yup, you got a peepee -pee now. Oddly, everything in the medicine cabinet is printed backwards, similar to the water flowing in reverse at the hotel. Ava gets up, asking him to put the kettle on, and still not quite comfortable in her new skin, stammers, of course, and comes up behind her, embracing her just as Voss spotted when spying on them earlier. She smiles, you're in a good mood this morning, and he starts to carve an apple with a knife just as Voss did. She brings up not hearing him get in from the conference that he was supposedly at, fibbing that he took a late flight, calling the experience thrilling in a sarcastic way. She senses something is off, asking what's with him today, and he insists that he doesn't know what she means. Her still asserting he's gone strange on me. Don't want to blow your cover, Voss, but there's other concerns that rear their head. A strange floating white blob appears in front of him, spinning erratically in the air, and when grabbing it, it disappears. Must be one of those anomalies that Gerda warned about. He heads off to work at Zuthru, and appears to have a quite low-level position, a bunch of drones all mindlessly shuffling in line to gain entry. He's instructed that he's on curtains and blinds duty today, and another worker, Eddie, comes up excited about having sex with some filthy East Coast girls. Hmm, good for you? What about you? He asks Colin, smirking back, what do you think? Eddie deems it impressive, cut queening the boss's daughter. Haven't heard that term before, thanks Eddie. Cut queening, okay, well, well I gotta make sense. The whole setup in Zoo Through is a frightening and actually somewhat hilarious send up of the next step of Amazon. Entire groups of employees who watch unsuspecting folks through their mini devices cameras in order to learn more about the products they use. Colin straps on some goggles, finding himself in a virtual office environment with a webcam showing someone's apartment on the screen. He hones in on the curtains, describing them out loud, and then switches to another a small child using a phone. No blinds, useless. And seeing how this could quickly get a little too personal and uncomfortable, on the next cam, it's a couple about to get down. Understandably a bit distracted by the intimate sight he's surveying. Immediately, a voice rings out asking if something is wrong and chides him for moving at a snail's pace. He refocuses, zooming in on the blinds, trying to ignore the couple porking, rattling off the curtain's details. Privacy, what's that in our techno age? I think that's the whole point here. He's overtaken by something, hearing disconnected voices and gross tense another anomaly floating in front of him. He reaches out to touch it, and it disappears as soon as he does. He begins to hyperventilate and hides his hand, the same hand that Voss was having trouble with shaking. Flashes of stuff invade his mind, the fan beginning to melt, and sees himself on one side of a mirror, a blurry Voss on the other. Their two faces lined up. There's a flash of Liam with a bloody cross on his cheek, and he wakes up on the floor, hearing Gerder asking him to check in. She asked what happened. Her level spiked and couldn't reach her, excusing that it was nothing. She was just in the mine and couldn't freely speak. Hearing his voice overlapped with control. hers, assuring everything is normal and there's no disruption on this end. And again blames the new tech for not watching her levels. Well, the reality is obviously that this is taking a major toll on your brain and you're not going to admit it, are you? She says she'll have him run a deep analysis, asking her to report back if she sees anything, artifacting and what have you, gravely stating that they can't have any mistakes with this one. He ventures back to Voss's house, seeing Mike and their boy there, Colin looking on longingly. We pass through skyscrapers, the shot turning upside down, just as Colin's mind appears to be. You're not in control right now, buddy boy of bosses. Back at the apartment, several of Ava's friends are there to celebrate someone's promotion at the company. They prod him for working down in the mines, deeming it basically slave labor, learning it was the angry step bro and guy behind this whole mission that got him into that position, wondering why he doesn't just quit. Another lady, Rita, finds it gross, wondering how much puss he sees in a day, and proudly states that she masturbates right in front of her webcam so they know exactly what vibration she uses. Thanks for the data, Rita. She interrupts him in the bathroom, asking Colin if they can be friends again, saying that Ava doesn't care. He nods, sure, okay, whatever. Her asking to call when she's back from Chicago. Sounds like he does have a little side action going on after all. Cut queening champ over here, it turns out. Later he vapes, staring out the window into the vast skyscrapers. And in a mirror to the earlier dinner scene with Michael, Ava comes in apologizing for her friends staying longer than anticipated. He assures her it's fine and crawls into bed. Her asking what's going on with him, thinking he seems so deformed these days, and thinking it must be the job, tells him he can quit if he wants, but he swears, on his life he's fine, and they bone. She starts lightly choking him and covering his mouth, and interestingly, he slash Voss looks way more into this encounter than with her husband. Flashes of Voss are seen when he flips over, and gets more intense, seeing that she perhaps prefers this body to her own. Maybe she just likes having a penis, not sure, it's getting weird around here. Even in the machine, Voss begins to moan, 
alone, sitting there lifelessly. And then back in the room, she's there. Things get all distorted and yep, see Voss with a penis, flashing back to Colin a bit confused. Even though it's Colin's body, this tells us that it's really Voss's consciousness in the driver's seat, which becomes important later. In the morning, she reaches out to Gerder, who has some concerns. The analysis turned out inconclusive, but Voss isn't worried, saying everything is totally fine. Besides, she'll be out in 24 hours, as the big party is tonight. Gerder asks her to do her daily frequency recalibration and sticks the prong into his scalp, dialing it in. And as before, tries to fake a smile while the machine buzzes, but can't hold it back and starts to tear up, but tries to keep his cool. It's party time at Father John's massive estate, hearing him addressing the crowd with pompous glee, remembering a quote, that boredom is a dream bird that hatched the egg of experience. He tells them he is bored with them, to some scattered laughs. He goes on he's bored because they're so flawless, and thusly he has nothing to do. Yet in his boredom, an egg is hatched, and from it comes the next stage in the evolution of their work. To boredom, everyone toasts. Ava takes Colin to meet him, jabbing that he got him the job, which is hopefully not beyond his skill set. Colin mutters, obviously annoyed he's fine, but he keeps poking, telling him derisively to let him know if it's too difficult for him. What a dick. Well, Colin is a drug dealer that is dating his daughter, so not exactly the best candidate in that sense, to be fair. Ava fetches him a gin, and he wanders off into another impressive room, calling into Girder that he's in place. She tells him to get into a fight and make sure that the crowd sees, instructing him they can finish this another night. Back with the crowd, he appears a bit drunk. He slurs his words, asking if she wants another drink, and stumbles away. He approaches John, chatting with some other bros, scoffing, can we help you? Colin says that he feels he owes him an apology. Is that right? John replies, I have a feeling, he nods. He chuckles, my future son-in-law, and tells him to fuck off and don't dirty his floor. He presses harder, saying he'll leave when Ava is done with his junk in her mouth. <laughs> oh boy, you're getting serious there. He laughs and grabs his arm, and gets held back by two catering dudes. Colin yells, you can't step on me, I'm a giant, and calls Ava a bitch to boot. He's socked in the stomach and unceremoniously tossed outside. Now alone, he appears much more calm than would be suspected, indicating his rash behavior was in fact all an act. Thunder, clapping in the distance, he waits until the party dissipates and loads his gun, seeing Ava and her father inside, and doesn't listen to Gerter's instruction to not go through with the killing tonight. He enters the house, and again, rather than the gun he was given, instead opts for the much more vicious fireplace poker. Ava and John are both clearly drunk, John offering that she can stay the night. She calls him an unbearable creature and downs the rest of her drink, excusing herself to bed. He slurs for her to fuck off to Dubai with her mother. Dubai and goodbye. Pretty clever, actually. He goes for another drinky poo as Colin enters and takes a seat. He asks what he's doing here, and Colin places his gun on the table. Not even a little rattled, he threatens to get out before he calls the police. Why don't you make me? He shoots back. John scoffs, he's drunk, and going to bed, and surprises Colin with a sucker punch that he easily dodges. And and slashes him with the poker. Colin proceeds to mercilessly whap the absolute hell out of him with the poker, then jams it into his mouth, twisting it around. Ava comes in, gasping at the sight, and Colin retrieves the gun, firing several shots into her back. Back to John, he yanks out the poker and jams it into his eye, plucking it out like a grape. This is definitely one of those uncut shots because woo wee, that is gruesome. And oh no, the Sean Bean curse of getting killed and pretty much everything he does continues. Or does it? Next up is Ava, hearing her groaning and weakly falls down. He casually saunters right up to her and pushes her hair back. He takes a deep breath and shoots her in the head, blood splattering all over his suit with literally no reaction whatsoever. Dang, boy. Appropriately, the brewing storm heard looming closer. He turns the gun on himself, calling to pull me out, but again struggles to pull the trigger, flashes of golden images in his mind. He puts it back in his hand, starting to shake. He screams to get me out, the reality seeming to blur together, seeing Voss and Colin literally physically attached. Voss pulls away painfully the two now separate in some sense. He takes a massive shard of glass and jams it into that one spot on the back of his head, sputtering away. In the machine, Voss coughs up blood, alarmed that she's surging. Gerder urges to not let her out as the signal is heavily compromised. Colin, it seems, has wrangled control away from Voss. Out in the streets, his vision blurry and appearing frightened. Colin now is essentially in control, but Voss is still there in his subconscious. The medic backs this up, saying Voss is unable to maintain control of his will, and and seeing a great deal of bleed through. The medic warns there's already significant damage that will only get worse the longer that she stays in, Gerder maintaining that she stays in. Colin snatches some fresh clothes and in a bathroom removes the shard from his head. His phone rings and it's Gerder asking for a word. Terrified, he throws the phone away and now quite paranoid, hides amongst the crowd, worrying that anyone could be following him. As more memories flood in of Voss's son and their cat, their consciousness is starting to melt together, bleed through as they said. He goes to visit his side
side piece Rita and starts going on that he did it so they can be together. He continues that they attacked him. All he was doing was defending himself and longs that he should have just stayed with Michael. Who's that? She asks. In a daze, he responds he doesn't know. Again, getting some real bleed through going here. Seeing his wound, she wants to get him to the hospital, but he refuses, certain that he'll be all right. She's about to go out of town, Chicago, he remembers, and says that he got into a fight with Ava and can't go home asking to stay here. Poor baby, she coos, and gives him a passionate kiss. Yep, they definitely bone him, and allows him to stay for two nights, leaving to take a shower. Alone, Colin mumbles to himself, of course, darling, mentioning being starving, exactly what Voss was practicing before visiting her family. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out the gun, staring at it, and gets to his feet, venturing to the bathroom, hearing the shower running. He slowly approaches and trains his gun on Rita. She turns to face him, seeing it's Voss wrestling back into control for the moment. Though we don't see the outcome just yet. Rather, we're presented some surprising news about John, learning that he survived, although Ava did perish. Paramedics came just in time to save his life. Way to go, Beanie Boy! You broke the curse. Sure, you don't have teeth and lost an eye, but hey, alive's alive, right? Colin is intruded by a frantic knocking at the door. It's his pal Eddie having heard that he was in some kind of accident, and Rita herself apparently called him over. He's confused. Oh, you know Rita too? Sure do, he states, and tells him to get a drink. His back turned, Eddie fires a weird machine that knocks Colin unconscious. We catch a glimpse of the surviving John strapped to a chair, Eddie clicking through signals on another ornate machine. John looks up, and it's Voss there, as Eddie continues fiddling with his machines. He talks to Voss, comforting her, there you go, you're coming back. He's managed to suppress the host's will, but urges that she has to move quickly before it wears off. She's wary of Eddie pulling the gun on him, but says that he was sent as a plant by Girder, and he's the one that scouted Colin and everything. He tentatively takes down the gun, and Eddie knows all about Voss, praising her work, calling it an honor to meet her, and was a big fan of her stabbing of the lawyer as well. <laughs> okay, weirdo, I, yeah, wait, I was really awesome how you stabbed the absolute shit out of that dude. You're my, my biggest idol. He orders to shoot him in the head, but he can't pull the trigger. He understands the guilt is difficult, but he's just here to fix his head, knowing that he doesn't have complete control right now, and tells him to get back down, as they don't have much time reinserting the line. He checks the sink on the machine, seeing a series of images, and answers what they are, a fox or a bird or whatever, and he answers correctly on each. Now it's time for a pulse analysis. He switches the machine, and it starts to rapidly click, flashing between between Colin in the real world and Voss in the unconscious as Colin enters the room. He gets on top of her and starts strangling Voss. He then goes for the sides of her head and crushes her face like a melon with a quick snap and takes off her face, placing it as a mask over his own. There's the creepy poster image in action for you. Donning her literal face appears to give Colin deeper access to all of Voss's memories, experiencing recent memories of hers in real time, like killing the lawyer, the lifeless humping with Michael, and most alarmingly sees her house, now knowing where she lives. And Pulls at the mask, gripping it away. Colin chokes awake, the gun on his chin and covered in blood, discovering Eddie dead on the ground. Ah, oh, fuck, he mutters, realizing what he's done, and goes to wash his hands, seeing Rita also dead in the shower, overwhelmed by the many violent memories flooding into his consciousness. With this new insight to who Voss is, he whispers, you bitch, in the mirror and takes the gun to his temple, tempting her to take a shot, screaming to do it. A shot rings out but misses, shattering the mirror instead. Colin laughs to himself, you missed, and blinks back to her house. Hi, darling, he says in a disembodied voice, Voss miming the same line in the machine. Just as we've seen before when communicating with Voss, their voices are heard as one, the link between the two becoming more tenuous and dangerous. This is especially true for Voss's family, now that Colin knows exactly where they are. It's time for some vengeance. Pretty much you destroyed my life, now turnabout is fair play. Showing up outside her house, stepping to the end of the alley, he vapes just as she did and repeats the same phrases she practiced. The boy pops out and innocently comes out to say hello. He asks his name. Colin thinking he knows him from somewhere, and points to his house, and asking, is that where he lives? Michael appears at the front door, calling the boy back. And yeah, now he knows for sure this is her house, confirming what he saw in his mind. He patiently waits until nightfall to make his move, ringing the bell and pounding on the door until hearing Michael approaching. He claims to be a friend of his wife's. This is enough for Mike to cautiously open the door, informing him that she doesn't live here anymore. About to slam the door on him, Colin barges in and busts out his gun, demanding to know where she is. He says that he doesn't know, but is probably out of the country. Call it asking him to understand what she's doing to him. This leads into a bizarre and purposeful monologue from Colin about what he believes makes Voss who she is. That it's all about cat litter and brain worms, of course. He begins by asking Mike if he ever thought of Voss like a predator, but he doesn't understand. He paints a picture of one day his wife is cleaning cat litter and gets a worm in her head that ends up in her brain. The next thing that happens is she gets an idea there too, but it's hard to say whether the idea is really her or just the worm that makes her do these certain predators
bigger things. She eventually realizes that she is not the same person anymore, positing. It makes you wonder whether you're married to her or the worm. Brain worms and cat litter, what the hell are you talking about, Colin? That certainly was a doozy. The whole concept here with his speech is looking at the very core of Voss's character and why she's having this kind of breakdown with who she was and who she is becoming. It is at least established that she's married and has a child. And though we don't know, assumedly lived in family bliss for some time until things took a turn thanks to her position at the company. And as she did more and more jobs, she's become more withdrawn and distant from them, becoming more interested in bloodlust and the thrill of becoming someone else entirely. Her family life becoming the doldrums and the body swapping assassin comes to provide her outlet for her feelings and to escape this boring life. So as Colin asks, Michael, it makes you wonder who you're even married to anymore because she must have changed into the cold-blooded murderer that she is now. Colin goes boss, pointing the gun on Mike, asking if she sees this, you bitch, again asking her to take control. You come out or I'll do it. Things get blurry and she appears, her voice distorted asking what he's doing here. Colin says he's been looking for her and wanted to talk about what she's doing to him and his life. Though as we know, things aren't that simple since he was physically the one doing these things. Boss retorting, done to you, you're the one in control. Which again, at the moment at least, is true. He argues that he hasn't been feeling in control of himself lately, but you have. Where's Ava? She asks, drawing closer. Where's your lovely girl? Can't you remember? No, that wasn't me, he screams. Poor Michael, Voss says, admitting she did at one point love him. Fix this, or I'll kill him, Colin threatens. Surprisingly, she shrugs, eh, just kill him, as he's only holding her back. This is what you always wanted. Mike seizes the opportunity and grabs a gun and gets Colin in the shoulder. He goes for a big ass knife and slashes the hell out of him, really hammering home those violent tendencies. Things are obviously a bit muddy as who is behind this murder at the moment because as we thought we remembered it's Colin in control right now and this is him succumbing to his own bloodlust and desire for revenge, not Voss, but perhaps not as Colin calls to Girder to pull her out and jams the gun in her mouth, making it appear that it was actually Voss in control and she is actually shedding her long, dangling, troubling thread in becoming a truly cold-blooded assassin. Her family, as Gerder said. She still can't pull the trigger on herself, though, almost like she is so unwilling to go back to being her real self. And out of nowhere, she gets a knife to the neck. Colin reactively fires and hits the boy in the chest. To make the point more clear, even after seeing what she's done, we see it is Voss who unloads on her son and fires several more shots, splattering the boy's heads to bits. In another twist, the boy groans to pull him out. His and Colin's blood pools meshing into one as they bleed out. And Gerder is removed from her own link, actually in control of the boy. This indicate that she knew Voss would struggle in doing the final move of taking her own life, which she hasn't done successfully so far. So she decided to intervene for her own means. She looks over to Voss as she is successfully pulled out. Seeing Gerder, she understands that she was tricked in a way. This whole thing was for her ultimate desires, which is reinforced in the final scene, where Voss has truly shed that one final thread and weakness Gerder spoke of at the beginning, as well as grooming her in the necessity of looking for the inevitable replacement. Doing another decompression check, they go through the same objects as after Holly's mission. She recalls her grandfather's pipe, as well as the butterfly she killed and mounted, but in contrast to the beginning, she expresses no guilt. Now we get that just as Gerder wanted, Boss has shed her weak attachment to her family, fully stepping into her role as her successor, and no more feelings holding her back, really falling pawn to Gerder's master plan in the end. But she seems okay with it, to be fair. I mean, who wants a husband and kid anyway, when you can swap bodies with someone and become a badass, cold-blooded assassin. Come on, not even really a choice here. I don't think so. And now she can truly embrace that character that she had created. That brings us to the conclusion of this explained video on Possessor. At least I think so. Not even sure who I am anymore after all that. Anyways, I said I really dug this one and loved the way it presented the story. Because as soon as it ended, I was full of questions. Oh, why did this happen? And then you start to think of another part and go, oh, I get it. That makes sense. I just appreciated the degree it took things to provide a complex and engaging view experience that isn't always so easy to come by. So kudos to Brandon, you've done your pops proud. And don't forget that you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Possessor and its ending? Would you have made the same choice as Voss and chosen the life of Lonely Assassin instead of her family? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next year. That sounds weird, but it'll be, you know, a week. <laughs>